Hello and welcome back to another episode of Lexcon Crypto. We are excited that you are here. We have started to see quite an increase in listeners as the show has begun to gain some traction. And we know it's in great part because of our subscribers and followers and want to thank you for that. Please share the show, share the content as you like and as you feel it is helpful to you and to those in your social networks. We love getting comments and questions. We've been able to field a lot of those things and even make connections along the way. We're building quite a community here. and We're excited to see that and excited that you are a part of it. Today's guest is Robert Matarazzi. He's the CEO of Luca. Luca is an exciting new platform that has been in the space and in the crypto space now for a little while, but really has started to over the last, I would say, six to 12 months. And Robert will correct me, but I'd say six to 12 months really started to gain some traction. And I think that traction is as the market is starting to mature, is starting to, to evolve to a place where visibility, uh, data, um, further insight is growing uh, critically important, especially as we start to see institutional money starting to really view crypto as a viable asset. They need to have the infrastructure in place to be able to support that. And so, uh, uh, Robert, we're really excited to uh, have you on the show today. We're excited to to hear from you and, and learn more about Luca. Why don't we start just simply, how did you end up starting a crypto company? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me, Andrew. We uh, And so I'm actually not the founder of Luca. I've been with Luca now just over, over four years. However, the company was founded in 2014. And... And I was asked to be CEO about two years into my employment here. So that was at the beginning of 2020, originally a co-CEO and then uh, and then the sole CEO after we closed our Series C fundraise Great. in end of 2020 that was led by State Street. Okay. I, I was at PwC before, to answer yep. your question, and I was not working in crypto. However, I was working in a lot of large technology and risk-driven programs that were very focused on the underlying technology, operational cybersecurity risks associated with all the different products that support the financial institutions across financial services. And was introduced to Luca. I had my eyes opened by an interview on how material crypto assets were being used across the world, even back then, which was really mind blowing. Right. And that caused me doing more research and really when we realize that these assets are traded for one another in fractional quantities across borders without fiat often as part of the transaction, anyone that understands that I think would agree that this has the potential to change just commerce across the world in ways that we haven't seen before. So it was really, that was the, I'd say the beginning of the decision and on on why I was attracted to the industry. And then Luca was doing all the plumbing for that industry. It was the not sexy side of, of all of it. We have all these innovators that are doing great things and creating trading project products and everything, but it leaves a lot of really messy and difficult to use data in its right. trail. And right. so at a, at a high level, that's what we're doing at Luca is we're collecting and uh, massaging that data to make it usable for mature business operations. Yeah. And I, this seems to me like I guess if I'm thinking of the category of where Luca fits inside of the industry, it sort of, it, it strikes me as an infrastructure play. Would you absolutely. agree with that, or do you oh, think you absolutely. guys are evolving? Oh no, it's squarely in that category. And the infrastructure from there, we can build lots of other things on top of it. Right. But it's, even if it's managing risk or compliance reports or risk models and valuation techniques, that's all on top of all infrastructure type of capability. We the ecosystem with. So for a customer like State Street, which I know that you guys have announced and are doing work with on the institutional side, and it seems to me like we're seeing a lot of interest across, even if it's headlines or rumors or things of other large institutions who are starting to um, consider and look at and wonder how they might interact and start to hold onto in perhaps a custody manner onto crypto. How does Luca interact with them in a way that that helps and serves them? So it's really interesting. Traditionally, banks have a lot of technology, a lot of it that's not very compatible with crypto assets. And that's most businesses, right? Not just the banks. And so they've historically, so over the past, we'll call it four or so years, been doing a lot of research, creating innovation labs, collecting a lot of information, but they've been a bit more cautious when actually starting to generate revenue. Definitely very cautious to hold crypto on their balance sheets 
And so as they're thinking about how to start generating revenue off of all the momentum that's going on, what we've seen is the fund ecosystem has been a first mover. So crypto funds will form. That requires the fund administrator to need to have a capability to administer them that maybe they didn't have before. So usually that generates a sale for Luca because we'll augment their traditional systems with systems that can handle the crypto data and the crypto portfolios. So then they can do what they normally would be doing as a fund administrator. Similar answer to custodians, because that's a complementary service offering from all of these big banks. A couple different barriers to do it. We're seeing a lot of them work with companies like Fireblocks or Copper yeah. and so on yeah. in a sub-custody instead of building the technology themselves. A lot of this is for a number of reasons. And there's risk reasons why they might be doing it. And I'm speaking very generally, not to State Street specifically, but there's different risk reasons. But ultimately, the thing that I think is worth noting the most is just customer or client demand. If you've got one of your biggest customers that you've had for decades is saying, hey, we just got exposure to crypto. Can you still provide services to me? They're going to they're gonna go out of their way to make sure they can have that offering. And so we've seen the fund administrators enter first and then naturally custodians is next. We've seen some other brokerage businesses. Definitely, there's a lot of momentum and different types of brokerage offerings. And I don't mean just the crypto native exchanges and everything that have been offering services for a while, yeah. but more traditional brokerages that are actually in a similar way to the custodians using some type of a crypto execution platform in a sub layer. But then we're also seeing clothing retail brands contact us saying they've got crypto on their balance sheet or payments companies, or it's really exciting right now seeing all of the different industries that maybe we haven't seen historically in crypto yet are definitely moving at different paces, but they're all moving. Yeah, no, for sure. You can feel, e even though from the crypto perspective, we all feel like we're in a the crypto winter, there are globally I indicators across multiple industries of new adoption, new users, ways that, that large brands or big businesses are incorporating uh, crypto in, into their businesses. And of yeah. course, creating exposure, which to your point, then affects uh, the banks that are managing those clients. And there's, there, there's exposure you know, essentially downstream from the consumer. And it creates right. a, lot, a lot of challenges. Are these the things that have, in your opinion, held up a large institutional uh, adoption to, to date? Is it the Fortune 500s really saying to their banks and to their bankers, we need to carry these on our balance sheet now and you guys need to figure that out? Or, or is it really the regulatory un, like problems, the unclarity? Like, what do you think is weighing into the mind of these guys now? It really depends on the business. If we look at the crypto native exchanges, I'm sure most of them would say that regulation or lack of guidance very often adds complexities to their business and, and makes their lives more challenging. However, they've been operating for a long time without any rules in the background. And we probably should, or I think most people would agree, we should have had some a bit earlier. Absolutely. Uh, and then you've got the traditional financial institutions that are already very heavily regulated, and they're not going to get into a new business if they're violating regulation. So they're doing that out of the gate. And some of them might be waiting for mature regulation to actually make their move to enter because they want to make sure that they're doing it by the book. They want to learn from other people's lessons. And we see companies that all do it a bit differently. State Street was pretty early to move in compared to the other fund administrators. We started conversations with them a while ago, but it takes a lot. There's a lot of education with these companies and, and a lot of proofs of concept and really feeling out the use cases on exactly how they can benefit and ultimately generate revenue. And we see a lot of projects that have not been successful over the years across a ton of big organizations. But now we're starting to see a lot of them that are successful and are actually generating revenue today. It's here. There are use cases. I think the ones that try to stay practical and simple out of the gate and then use that to start learning are the ones that tend to get moving the quickest. Yeah, that, it, it does depend on what part of the industry you're looking at that from. Yeah, and I think that plays to the natural conservative nature of a banker, doesn't it? To, to really want to drill down and know exactly the parameters in which they're mm -hmm. able to operate. And I think you know, to, to your point, 
over eight years ago, the SEC made statements that they were taking regulatory oversight of the crypto space. And yet there has been very little, if any, guidance provided by them. And I know that they're looking at Congress saying the same thing. And so there's a, a lot of work to do. And obviously, that's why we've seen the number of bills that we've seen over the last several months. And this new Congress, I think, will have a lot of input into that. Now, mm-hmm. from, a, from, from Luca's perspective, while you aren't necessarily, I think the activities that you guys are involved in aren't regulated, uh, right. How do you guys interact with and how do you stay informed a- around the regulatory conversation in order to be able to work with the clients that you're working with? So we've hired a very mature and seasoned team that has expertise in a lot of the key areas that are required to support our customers who are the ones that are more heavily regulated. We are, we have to comply with privacy laws and sure. I call them the uh, the more consumer protection type stuff if we're for any consumer products and but it's a very light touch compared to financial regulation since we are a, a fintech and however all of our customers are dealing these conversations all day long and we service a lot of the government agencies and regulators as well with our products and services as they're conducting supervisory activities and or tax reporting and things like that. So we have to have the expertise in house to help educate because I well over 90% of any sale that we make or conversation where is education. You have to educate so much with everything, even starting with very basic stuff like, is this an asset class or not? Yeah. Or is it you know, like, how do we actually think about it? Is it multiple asset classes? Is it, does it fit into one of them? Which of these regulators has purview on different types of activities? And it's not black and white. It's very complex. And there's a lot of overlap because the technology touches arguably every single type of business out there in the world and hypothetically should touch every single regulator. And, and so we have hired, we've hired a PhD in accounting, Suzanne Morrisfield, who joined us as she was previously with IFRS and has held a number of other roles in her career. Brian Whitehurst recently joined us, Assistant Attorney General for New York. Our chairman, Nick, was a DTCC board member earlier in his career and so on. So we're constantly adding more, more talents and subject matter experts that can support our sales team, support our product development, and support our customers as we're having all these many conversations. Yeah, it's interesting. I was speaking to an advisor who works on the Hill. I can't really go further than that, but he was explaining to me the incredible brain drain that's occurring (laughs) around around regulators' offices. He said that he feels like the singular largest challenge to Congress and to regulatory agencies creating good uh, laws and enforcing good laws is the fact that so much of the great talent and great thinking has already been scooped up with unbelievable offers and opportunities that you can't blame them for taking, but you're also like, oh, where does the replacement come from? It's an interesting right. thing. And that's very true. And there's all kinds of business reasons why that exists. You can it can be a lot more lucrative to go actually work in industry than for a government agency, particularly in the United States. So there's some other countries that, that approach it a bit differently, like Singapore, which which is a very interesting one, I think, that's noteworthy, that has a very different model on how they incentivize some of those roles to bring in top talent, which seems like it's made some really a, a lot of impact out in Singapore. Sure. And that's top of mind because I just got back from there because we've just recently opened an office there. And there's a ton of momentum across really all dimensions of the crypto industry there, right. which is exciting to see. There's other solutions than just trying to actually hire them directly. And there's been a lot of discussions about bringing in the industry participants as part of those conversations. There's lots of working groups and consortiums and things. It could be done a lot better, in my opinion. Yeah. Like that could be led in a more material way that would actually incentivize some of these private organizations and their respective talents to be part of these really big topics because it's that big, it's that material and, uh, and the industry can help in a lot of ways. And honestly, between our customers, we see them act in a very mature way. Our customers at Luca do not fight the regulators. Right. They're, right. They usually try to collaborate with them. They're the more risk mature organizations that are trying to do things the right way without inhibiting innovation in an unnecessary way, though. That's the balance. The risk is always counterintuitive to innovation. Sure. No, it's clear that the with a global market cap now around crypto hovering around that $3 trillion number up and down, it's obvious that it's here to stay. 
And so the DGen and uh, Ape NFT world <laughs> will slowly, yeah, I think it will probably still always be a place like it is in Web2. Sure. There's still a place for the rebel. I think Reddit is an example of that, like the Wild West, perhaps. But there's always going to be a place for that. But you can imagine that that the mature, the reasonable is going to end up coming to some sort of a place where they start to have meaningful conversations and and regulators. And even if some of Reddit's products are very open-ended, they support really the voice of a lot of different communities. But even companies like that, they're, when it comes to their own back offices and their their organization, they're pretty mature. They have financial audits, they have auditors, they have regulatory reporting and so on. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So we interact with a lot of those while still supporting all those different communities. We have crypto funds that have portfolios of those NFTs and we have to know how to value them and we have to know how to report on them because then it actually helps those initiatives as well, even if maybe on the on the surface they are in that DGEN, yeah. the, diff- the different it, category. It, I think that's what make crypts, makes crypto so interesting too, it right? Is. You know, it melting is. Pot it, I, ideas. It, I think it's more of like the attitude of them more than it is necessarily the particular asset, let's right. say. I think if it's like you're, if you're really going to try and, and fight the machine, the machine is going to fight back. And I just think it's so important that we have reasonable conversations, especially as regulation is being formed. It's so fluid right now. And to to me, I feel like from an industry perspective, it could so easily go one way or the other. And you just, you hate to see the cases that come up where you're, where it's just blatantly, you know, where you can't even defend the actions that were being taken and love to see more reasonable conversations. And like you're saying, the working together of several of these new think tanks that are being founded, even Coinbase has started a policy think tank in the mm-hmm. last week. These types of actions are so necessary, I think, to elevating the overall conversation around policy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's a lot of, I mean, obviously the press focuses on the fumbles and the stories of, of some of the failures that we've seen, but there's, for every one of those failures in the press, there's another 20 success stories in this right, industry that's that right. are happening and are, or are busy at work right now, quietly creating operational efficiencies, reducing costs and making their business more resilient while the market conditions are down. Yeah, yeah. But they'll go and they'll thrive when the market starts to correct in the right direction. So I'm super interested in talking about Singapore. And you had mentioned that they have an alternative way of dealing with or retaining talent and dealing with regulators. I don't know if that's something that you're able to talk about, but I'm a bit of a layman in learning, but what with the way that it's been described to me, which this is all public information, is just that they're they're they bring in very high talent into those regulators and government agencies is the way it's been described. And so they've got not to say that we don't have talent in other regulators, but they've definitely attracted some talent that might not accept those roles if they weren't if they weren't paid as much. And obviously I think it would be naive to assume that an approach for one country works for all countries. I mean, you know, do you compare Singapore to the United States? And the United States is a lot larger. So not suggesting any of that, but I just think it is interesting. I think that they're doing some good things and we're seeing a lot of crypto businesses migrate to Singapore for a number of different reasons. And it's definitely become a very mobile city, but there's lots of other cities where we see lots of momentum as well. London is already pretty well established. There's tons of crypto related businesses there. They're in Lisbon, I did a trip out there recently, sure. and there's a lot of momentum. I'd say definitely an earlier phase, but a lot there. We also opened office in Zug, Switzerland. Yeah. Tons of momentum there. There are hundreds and hundreds of crypto businesses that are starting up and a lot of the big names that have big offices there. That's so there's great. lots of other areas around the world that where I think we're seeing a ton of momentum as well. And this is truly impacting global markets. And yeah. Definitely. I love, I've got to just say, I love the UK's proactive (laughs) messaging and positioning around crypto. It's an interesting thing where, you know, when I think of the UK, I think of their parliament and I think of people screaming at each other from side to side and like really great C-SPAN entertainment. But this seems to be, crypto seems to be an element where the entire government really has said, we're aligned on this and ministers and regulators together joining in this. And I thought it was interesting that within the first two days, the prime minister had a office taking office. She had a press conference specifically to make sure that everyone knew her position of being pro crypto and their desire to be the world leader in crypto. It's a, it seems an interesting and positioning for a country from that perspective. 
Yeah, and I've seen we've seen a lot of them put out guidance earlier than some other governments for sure. I know recently they've been in the press for other reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. And unrelated to the crypto, I will say though that we've seen some companies that have just straight out banned crypto and done some more drastic things that are interesting. And then years later, they've now tried to do it. Japan is a good example. We saw when I joined Luca, most of our institutional customer base, the majority of the volume was on Bitflyer. And then that changed really rapidly. And But now we're seeing a lot of crypto exchanges emerge in Japan as well, but they're still handcuffed until the regulation evolves and permits them to do business. But it's because they're trying to allow them to do it in a responsible way. And that's usually where Luca comes in. We can usually help with some of those pieces of the puzzle. And that's what our goal is to do. And we're seeing lots of other countries address it all in different ways. But I'd say most of them aren't resisting it. I don't see any, I don't see any signs of resistance in the United States across the various regulators, for example. They might not all have come up with solutions that the industry think are the best answers yet. But I do believe that the intentions were there. And this is why it's so important to educate, because they just maybe don't understand all of the problems fully yet. And so it's a, it's a but it's not because of, of a very black and white resistance or anti-crypto sediment. Yeah. Um, I, so. One of the things that I think has been made clear <clears throat> is that we really need, as a starting point of this conversation, and it might come back to your point about needing greater private public collaboration, there seems to be a real need to just to define terms. Um, Absolutely, I agree more. And thinking about asset classes <laughs> and where do digital asset classes fit? Do the do the protocols determine assets? Is there a difference between a proof of work asset or a proof of stake asset? Are those right. uh, just seems like an interesting thing that mm-hmm. I feel like we're stuck in the debate now of, is it a security or is it a commodity? And those are our only two options. And it has to be right. forced into one of those. I'll give you my opinion. And this is strictly my opinion, not that of Luca and, or of any, anyone else's. But in my opinion, this is technology that can be applied to all of those asset classes. We can tokenize securities, we can tokenize commodities, we can tokenize real estate, artwork. Clearly, we see that done all day long. We can tokenize anything that has value. And and so with that, why would we call all of those many assets just because they're tokenized the same asset class? So in, in my opinion, this is technology that can be applied to all asset classes. Um, it enables us to trade them in some new ways, which needs some consideration when we're supervising it and creating rules for it. And we're seeing some asset classes maybe that have emerged that weren't possible before this technology was available. So I think we absolutely will see some new asset classes, but they need to be looked at on an individual basis. And and I think a good practical approach is, hey, let's start with the low hanging ones first, right? We don't need to go and classify all of these assets in one go. We can start with the more material ones and then start working our way down. And there's going to be a lot of lessons along the way at Luca and our data products across our institutional customer base. We support over 100,000 spot crypto assets. That's a lot of assets to categorize. And we've categorized them with our some of our own products, which is really just a stepping stone to a longer term categorization of all of this. But it's a creating a new asset class is not a new thing that happens frequently. Right. And so anyway, that's my two cents on on a on that topic. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's really, it, it feels to me like it's part of the conversation at the, at at the regulatory level that to date has been overlooked (laughs) or overshadowed. And I I wonder if some of the action by the SEC, CFTC, especially most recently with the Uki Dow, if that's them trying to make those definitions, trying to clarify their, their space by using regulatory action in order to do that. It seems like a lot of them are, I'm hearing more and more the different regulators start to say things like, hey, it's more about the use of the asset and the actions that are dictating which regulator has purview instead of just looking at it based on the asset. You can use Bitcoin for payments. You can use it as an investment vehicle. There's tons more use cases you can use for Ether and all the assets you can stack on there with smart contracts. If it's someone's treating it like a capital asset, they're buying it, they're holding it long, right. Like that's going to raise the eyebrows of a different regulator than someone that's using it for loans or yeah. consumer lending 
or and we start to touch a lot of different agencies. So it is a, it's tricky and it's very intricate. But. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And that on that topic, we could probably continue having that conversation for that. That's going to be a, an ongoing months and probably years conversation globally, I think, as those things start to reach some sort of consensus and a, agreed upon position. But Robert, mm-hmm. you have been extremely generous with your time and insight and, and knowledge on the space. And I just I want to thank you so much for for joining us on Lexicon Crypto. Our I've benefited. I'm sure our listeners have benefited from from our time together this morning. So, I just want to say uh, say thank you to you. What are some ways that that perhaps our listeners could find out more information about Luca or connect possibly with you on social or something like that? What are some ways to do that? Yeah, and thank you very much for having me, Andrew. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, they can find us. Our main website is Luca. We're additionally a, a great way to follow a lot of our blog posts and the perspectives that we put out is even just by following our, our LinkedIn page as well. Great. And uh, and then you can see all of our other social links from our, our corporate website. Awesome. That's great. Robert, again, thank you so much. Best of luck to Luca as you guys continue to pioneer the space. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again for having me, Andrew.